bless you guys. God is alive, He is present. I agree we, we sing the song airing a mudimohona. Eh, Ropela Pinerin, God is here. Nak Satola Gibata theory a mudimu gibata practical. I no longer want the theory of God, I want a practical. Amen. Amen. I don't want to hear about God. I want to see Him. Amen. Amen. All right, we are continuing where we left off. On the principle of following Christ. I just want to continue where I left off last week. Let's go to our scripture. John chapter 12, verse 23 to 28. It says, but Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, that's verse 24, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If Anyone serves me. Him my father will honor. Yo, I love that part. If anyone serves me. Him my father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Remember when he started, he says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So, you can see the paradox right there. The, the, the apparent contradiction. When he says, should I say, Lord, save me from this hour. The hour that he said is the hour for him to be glorified. It means for him to get to that glory. There would be suffering that is so bad that you could be tempted to say, oh Lord, save me from this. And part. then he finishes by saying, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Yeah, I wish we can all, all say that. Ne? Not, not necessarily about suffering. No, I'm not talking about suffering. I'm talking about the hour. That all of us will come to that hour where you say, now I know for this purpose I came to this hour in my life. Father, glorify your name. Mm, may you reach that hour in Jesus' name. Okay, so we, we covered a few things last week that when Jesus, everything is one thought from, the, from verse 23 to verse 28. Okay, Jesus was using the grain of wheat because you use wheat to make bread. And he, Christ, is the bread of life. And he says, unless the grain of wheat falls down and dies, it remains alone. But if 
it dies. You see, that's the, the key. The, the grain must die. Somebody say so, the grain must die. And we all know how this works. But Jesus was talking about himself. And I said last week, where it says, and it dies. In other languages, it gives the sense that, and it multiplies. And it produces. Okay? We all know that there's no seed that can multiply until it dies. It's right. We were taught. We were taught from standard what what when we're still young. Okay, and Jesus said, "The hour has come for Him to be glorified." To be glorified is to be positively acknowledged. Recognized, esteemed for your character, esteemed for your nature, or your attributes. So Jesus is talking about being glorified. That's the that's the goal. The end point. Being glorified. Let me show you a scripture that jumps to my mind right now. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 verse 29. I want to show you something there. I don't have it here so you have to beam it for me. Romans 8 29. He read it. For whom he for new, he has done what? He has also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Let's go to 30. Are you about 30? Oh, whomever, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And then, whom he called, these he also called. Justified, and whom he justified. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is talking about the end point, the end goal. About why he is here on earth and has to go through everything he has to on the cross it is so that he will be glorified and the bible tells us that those who first begin by being conformed to sonship becoming sons they go through stages with God that culminate in glorification. Meaning, the same place Jesus said he has came, he, he came to earth to reach the same place God wants us to reach. He came to be glorified and therefore if you truly adopt sonship, your destination is glorification. Somebody say I'm listening. So we see in Christ how God works even with us. Okay. I just need to jump some things so that I don't take too much time on them. So for us to reach a point where we are glorified, there is a process also of dying. 
to serve that we have to go through. If you look at this technology of the seed, let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 36. Remember that Jesus said, he who loves his life will lose it. In other words, he who is more interested in himself than in me. Okay. This is not just about everyone and everything. This has got to do with him. So, uh, when he says he who loves his life, it is in comparison to him and his will. He will lose it. It means we as children of God, we cannot love ourselves more than we love Jesus. Here's a thought that flashed through my mind yesterday. If loving myself will benefit me more than loving Christ, are you hearing what I'm saying? Hmm? I want you to finish the statement before I finish it. If loving myself will benefit me more than I love Christ, then I think I can be justified to love myself more than I love Christ. But if loving Christ will benefit me more than I love myself, then the writing is on the wall. Yeah. I read this it's clear. It's better for me to love Christ more than loving myself. Because, you see, here's the thing we must see about this whole thing. That spiritual things or eternal things, they influence natural things. But natural things cannot control spiritual things. Hallelujah. Spirit, you see, spirituality can manipulate nature. But nature does not have the power to manipulate spirituality. It is the same as when the Bible says, one verse that I read to you, it says it is better for you to get wisdom than to get gold. To get understanding than to get silver because gold cannot purchase wisdom but wisdom can get you gold and silver cannot purchase understanding but an understanding can get you silver so it is much better for us to walk in the spirit than to walk in the flesh because the flesh cannot achieve the things of the spirit but the spirit can achieve more from the, for the flesh than the flesh can. The spirit, Moya. when the flesh is sick, the spirit can heal the flesh. When the flesh is tired, the spirit can give the flesh energy. Do you understand what I'm saying? When the flesh is under oppression, your spirit life can deliver your other part from Oh, demonic oppression. Demons don't fear people who walk in the flesh. 
Demons don't fear fleshly people, including Christians. You know why? Because you are operating at the realm they control. But once you die, look at your neighbor and say, die. <laughs> Listen, Bazalwan. When you take a seed and you plant it, you are taking it to the next dimension. Look at 1 Corinthians. I'm finishing the thought. I'm joining everything. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 36. Please read at read read the funny English because I always I I I, I examine the English and when it doesn't make sense, that's why I like it. Read that sentence. Huh? Mm. In a foolish one, what you what? Does not made alive unless uh -uh. how? Because when it dies, it dies. So it means there is something about becoming alive that has got nothing to do with nature here. When you plant a seed and it dies, you know what happens to it? When it resurrects, it does not resurrect as a seed. It resurrects as a plant. It moves from that dimension, it goes to the next dimension. One of my friends, who I like listening to, Pastor Ralph, he says there's a difference between migration and uh, moving to the next dimension. No. Migration and transition. He says, to migrate is to move to a different location. But to transition is to move to a different level. You go to another dimension. You see, in our lives, we, we need those two experiences. Sometimes you need to spiritually relocate to go to a new place with God where you adjust your beliefs the way you look at him. You move to a level of greater understanding. But sometimes we need to transition. To move in the same truth. You move from one dimension to another. Whether you call it going deeper or going higher, but you need to transition. And that's what happens with a seed. When you take a seed, that's why he says, foolish one, what you sow cannot be made alive. In other words, the life that is hiding inside this that is being sown, you cannot see it until what you see, what you sow, first dies. And look at what he, he says. It, is, it cannot be made alive. It cannot be made alive. In other words, it can it cannot activate what makes it alive. It does not make itself alive. You see, <laughs> listen, Bazalwan. I'm telling you the truth. Tell your neighbor, pastor is about to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you 
Believe it or not. There is there is a you in you that is waiting for you to die. And when that you resurrect, you will become a you you never thought you are. <laughs> Yeah, there is a you in you waiting for you to die for that you to resurrect. Go to verse 37, where we were reading. First Corinthians 15, 37. First Corinthians 15, 37. Read it with me. What does it say? And read it slowly. One, two, three, go. And what you sow is not what you eat. Go to verse 37. What you sow is not the body that will come into being, but the best seed. Let's continue. And it's hard to tell whether it's wheat or some other seed. Continue. But when it dies, are you reading? Oh, sorry, I'm reading it in the TPT. Okay, let me look at the screen. Let's read it together, verse 37. One, two, three, go. 37, give us 37, please. Go. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, Hi, perhaps with or some other. Would you Bible read? Hear what the Bible is saying. Iri, what you sow, you don't sow what will be. What is what will be? What will be is what will become after what is sown dies. That is what will be. Let me tell you, I'm telling you the truth. I'm repeating what I say. What you can be. Listen. Just like if you sow what you are sowing and when it arises, it is not, it does not look like, it does not even resemble what you sow. It is so different from what you sow because it dies. And at the time it dies, guess what? What killed it? What killed the seed? was the soil and the water. Once he spoke, twice I heard. Once he spoke, twice I heard. It says, what kills the seed is the ground and the water. Hmm. What kills us is our experiences because the ground speaks of the flesh dying to the flesh but being watered with the word. And when the word waters, what comes out is so different from what dies. There is a you you don't know. And that you, you will only know you. that person when he resurrects. Let's continue reading. Verse 38. Read. But uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh my God. 
Somebody say, oh my God. You see, when it is sown, it is sown by the sower. But when it rises, it's God who gives it a body. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So it is not the power of the seed. It is what God has put inside it. So when we do what is called dying to self or becoming unsaid, selfish or taking our cross and following Christ and we die to ourselves what is going to resurrect no man can do that what will resurrect is what God will do because it is God who gives it a resurrection body May you resurrect into your ultimate you. It is, Barcelona, it is at that point where at least you are able to say, for this reason, I was born. For this reason, I came to this hour. That hour doesn't come until we die to serve. Listen to how, you put, how it puts it in the Passion translation. And what you sow is not the body that will come into being, but the bare seed. <laughs> so you don't sow what is going to come. You only sow just the seed. Hey. You know, Bazalwan, following a life of the flesh is very disadvantageous. It's worse than daylight robbery. If you don't, if you don't follow the life of the spirit, you are robbing yourself of a glory that will not only impact your spiritual existence, but it will also impact your natural existence. Look at Jesus. He did the will of God. Jesus was never without any provision. Jesus did not need a bank account to be provided for by God. He knew he was the son of God. And that nature was supposed to obey him. And so if there was a financial need at a time where the bank was far, or maybe Judas was not there, I don't know. Judas maybe not there. Jesus would simply say, my father's creation has got what I need. Peter, Peter, you are a fisher. Go. Use your skill. God still uses our skills for the supernatural. Peter, use your skill to catch fish. I will use my position as the son of God to make sure where you exercise your skill, I will bring the supernatural so what you catch will come out with the money we need. So God can take your skill. You see, you know what it is called, the common grace? It's called consecrated grace. In other words, when you take your common grace, your, your talent, the ability God has given you, and you consecrate it to God, God will make your fish come out with a coin in its mouth. You will make money where people normally do not make money. Hmm? 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm saying you will make money. Mula. Where people, people do not normally make mula. Because you took your skill and you consecrated it to the Lord. And the Lord put a coin in the mouth of a fish. Live a consecrated life. And it's hard to tell whether it's wheat or some other seed. He says, but when it dies, God gives it a new body. When it dies, God gives it a new body. When it dies, God gives it a new body. A body to fulfill his body. And cease to eat that each seed gets a new body of its own and becomes the plant he designed it to be. The seed to become a plant. The seed to become a plant. You see, you are born to multiply. But if God is going to make you multiply, it begins by you dying to self. Listen, Jesus died alone on the cross. And when he resurrected, he became a body called the body of Christ called the church. He died by himself. But his resurrection brought forth multitudes. Now, let's go to verse 26 of John chapter 12. Uri, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Just keep it there for some time. Because I want us to examine it. Listen to what our Lord says. He who wants to serve me must follow. Okay? So, to follow, it means to be in the same direct, in the same way. In other words, in the same lifestyle. The same path. It has got more to do with values and morality and things like those. So he who wants to follow, who wants to serve me. Are you listening? He who wants to serve me, he will serve me by following me. Because he, 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 in following me, he will be in the same way as me and he will do what I do. And then he says, this person, he's talking about this person, anyone who serves me, let him follow me. And then this is the result. Where I am, there, the one who wants to serve me will be also. Again, so where I am, there, my servant will be. Now here's a big question. 
when Jesus says, where I am, wherever he will be, what will he be there for? Mm -hmm. We will be listened. What would be the purpose of him to be where he will be? Well, there are two words there that caught my attention. He says, where I am. Mm. How many of you remember I am? You remember I am? Mm. I am, we get it from Hoya, the root name of God, which means to exist. Moses said, Lord, if thy say who sent me, who shall I say sent me? And Jehovah said, tell him, I am the one who exists. Is the one who sent me. When Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees and those who were opposing him, he says, before Abraham was, I am. And if you understand that Jesus does not go anywhere without a purpose, then where the question wherever Jesus says he will be why would he be there he will be there to be in other words to manifest to manifest himself so Jesus is saying wherever I am there my servant will be in other words my servant will manifest what I manifest where I will be and then we we, we we move forward 2,000 years. And now he is no more here physically. He is in heaven. But the statement still holds water. Wherever I am, there my servant will be. So he is in heaven. So how can he be? The only way for him to be in the 20th first century is to be where his servant is with the purpose of being there to manifest him. So, to materialize that scripture, we say, wherever my servant will be. It will be because of where I want to be. My servant is the one who goes to become what I am supposed to be where I am sending him. Hallelujah. It's called image. It's called a representation. It's called being formed into the same image as him so that wherever I am, that is where Christ will be. Now, listen. This is where dying to self makes sense. Yeah. That's why it makes sense now. Because, let me give you an example. Um, can you come? Just come here. I want to make a, 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 a quick illustration. You guys, will you be able to catch me if I'm here with the camera? If I'm on the floor? I'm, I'm just, will you? Okay, fine. I won't go very far. Right? Wherever I am, there my servant will be. So, in Christ's time, whoever wants to serve me will follow me. There we go. So, that's what makes him a servant to Christ. He is 
following. Him. So wherever Christ is, he is. And then Christ resurrects and ascends to heaven. But he is still there. So he has got a life to live. But he is surrendered to Christ. So Christ will say, okay, son, I want to hear. I want to do something. Then he must, so he must put aside his agenda. Let me tell you, if you clog your life with personal agendas, you will not have time to become a servant of Christ. You can never define your life by the word monati. By this word pleasure. You will never serve Christ if all you are looking for in life is pleasure after pleasure after pleasure. Listen, we have to reach a point of contentment with life. Where you say it is okay. I can't push beyond this. I must be happy. If God promotes me, I will accept. But I will, I will not sacrifice my relationship with God on the altar. Of my personal things. Do you know why God uses people? It's simple. It is very simple. Do you know why God uses people? Because they are available. That's right. <laughs> It's not a complicated thing. God uses people because they are available. You know why God does not use people? God does not use people because they are not available. That's why the you in you cannot manifest until you die to yourself. Because when you die to self, you put your life under the control of the Father. Somebody say, I'm listening. You must be ready in and out of season. Yesterday we went to see uh, uh, our mama. Mama Vivia. Mama Vivian. So we're having lunch with her. And then there comes this, this uh, waiter. So when I lift up my eyes to look at her, I can see her face cringing. Like she's in pain. I said, you are in the right place at the right time. I said, uh, what's your problem? And she said, no, my fist are hitting. I said, ah. I was ready to pray for whatever sickness she had right there. Right there. I, I asked her because I wanted to say to her, can I pray for you now? Hey, hey. when you go to the restaurant, do that! Be a servant of Christ! Ask my wife, we do that from time to time. We pray for people in restaurants. We minister to them in restaurants. One time we went out to eat. There was a couple, old white couple. And God said, pay their bill. I don't know them. I don't know where they come from. <laughs> I just told the waiter, go and tell those people we will pay their bill. And we did. I don't know them. Why? Because I heard him. Hmm? Be ready. 
Be ready. Don't say you're on holiday. Yes, we are on holiday. But you don't belong to yourself. How many of you know it takes three minutes to tell a person, can I pray for you? And they say yes. And then you pray for them and you are on your way. That's it. It ends there. You get used to serving him. You see a person, they are hurting and you feel the compassion. Hey, what's up? What's going on? No, this has happened. This is happening in my house. Let's go have a drink somewhere. Give them 10 minutes of your time. Share Christ with them. That's, that's, that's low-lying fruit. No, low-hanging fruit. Those people are easy to win to the Lord. You go see your relative in the hospital. Here's somebody going, eh, eh, eh. You, you think if you go to that person and say, can I pray for you? They will say, get out of here. No! They will say, please do. You, two minutes, even sometimes less than a minute. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you heal this one. Period. You are on your way. Be ready. That's what it means to die to self and to live for Christ. Then when he sees you are faithful in small things, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Somebody say, I hear you. So, it is a matter of us being ready to serve. I, I, I hate, sometimes I hear one of the things I ask myself when I hear so and so is dead, whether it's a, a celebrity, when I hear about the death, What's the first question? Hey. And then I will say to my heart, Lord, help us to testify Christ. Because you don't know where people are going. Let me close with this one. I'm, I'm rounding up. And Jesus says, Jesus says, Anyone who serves me, everyone who serves me, that one, my father will honor. Do you know that? Okay, the first thing I heard this morning, I was in the office there. I hear they are singing happy birthday to you. Mm -hmm. I heard that. And I'm asking somebody, what's happening? That's honor. That's honor. I agree you don't do it for anybody like that. Why do you do it for her? It's because you are showing honor. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's how you show honor. Now, there has never been anyone here on their birthday, they are sitting with a balloon next to them saying, hmm? What is that? Honor. Three weeks ago, or four weeks, I went somewhere uh, to go and preach as a guest speaker. They were honoring an 80-year-old woman because she and her husband raised many sons. Many of them have got churches. I mean, they are moving on in life. And so she was late. Yeah, she was late by almost an hour. But let me tell you something. The program did not start. We waited. When she came in, everything was stopped. And then while it's a pina, they held her and they brought her in. The husband died many years ago. 
They put special chairs on the stage. Eight year old. Eight years. They were celebrating her eight years and also honoring her. She went and she sat there. There were tables set. Especially because of her. And we're sitting with nice, you know, cutlery. Because of her. And they raised an offering because of her. Now I'm thinking, here are people who are going through all this trouble to honor this 80-year-old. What happens when now it is not people who honor you. It is God who honors you. If people can do that for a person, how does God honor? I'm trying to make a comparison that, that when we honor people, we go all out. We do things. You understand? We do things for them. Now, when it is no more people, when it is God, how does God honor? And Jesus simply says, whoever serves me, my father, <laughs> May you never lose your honor from the Lord. I said, may you never lose your honor from the Lord. Because you know what does honor mean? To honor it, it is to put a price. Yeah, is to fix a value. Up, fix a valuation upon. Yeah, that's in, in Greek. In Hebrew, to honor is to be heavy. To have weight. Now, if God decides to honor you, it means you carry weight. You carry weight with the Father. And when he honors you, you see all these things that Mamruti was saying here about God breaking rules for you. He will do those things. He will give you a promotion when it's not time for promotion. Because, simply because you serve him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Simply because you are faithful to him. Money will come from places you never thought it will come from. Simply because you honor him. Where does it start? It starts with dying to self. Amen. To be to say, you know what? I, my life, my life is Christ. Christ. I am going to live for him. I'm going to serve him. I want to say this to young people. I said it to you last week. Young people, but demons have upgraded. Hey, the demons are sophisticated. Mm. They have changed the way they do things. They know if they manifest what we will say, come out in the name of Jesus. And they have to come out. And so now they are sublime. Sublime. They are hiding in places that they know you will never find them. They are hiding in places they know you go to but you will not identify them. There are principalities hiding in technology. Demonic principalities. They are hiding. <laughs> there are principalities hiding in the law. In the constitution. You. 
There are principalities hiding in the constitution of nations. They are hiding in movies. Principalities. They are hiding in songs. They are hiding in apps. I'm talking about demonic principalities. They are hiding in apps. And to you young people, you are the main target because you are the future. You are the main target because you are the future. Satan knows if I get the young people, I've got the future of any nation. So you young people, you need more power than we used to have. I got born again at 18. But if I look at what is happening today, ah, and I compare with the demons we have to deal with, ah, those ones of our time, they are nothing, man. Compared to today, I taboo ya namusa, man. Diabuwa. A young person who I tell They want a young person who is focused and so. And oh, aring if kiri kwa na wa mudim kia ikizor kira biang. Those who understand what they mean when they say I am a child of God. If I say I'm a child of God and I'm a young person, I know where to look and where not to look. I know where to go and where not to go. I know what to do and not what not to do. You have to be strong. You must be strong in the word. You must be filled with the word. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. How old is that girl? 21 year old. Who was preaching your guy expression? Yes. 21 year old preached here to older people during expression. Expression. And I hear she's powerful. You must be like that. You must be able to stand and preach the word of God and not be afraid. Not be afraid to go to your teacher and the, 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 or the, the deputy principal and say, Menier, I see there is no prayer here. If you are okay with it, once a week, I'm willing to stand at assembly and preach for five minutes. I will preach for five minutes. You will impact them more than a teacher will. You know why? You are wearing the same uniform they are wearing. You are doing the same subjects they are doing. You are living the same life they are living. But there is something you are saying out there to say there's a God in heaven and me be one of you I serve that God. And if you want that God, come to me. I will show you how to get that God. Hallelujah. Yeah. We need baby preachers. We, then, we need youth preachers. We need young adult preachers. Young adults. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we pray for young people today. Yes, Lord. We pray for them and we ask you, Amen. come on, if you want to be one of those young people, come here. Surround them. Surround them. Stand around. If you want to be that young person who says, me, ah, I'm rising up. preacher. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. If you are a young person who says, I'm come standing on. up, especially students, 
Students. Students. assembly or uh, I want to go to my school and preach. I want God to give me grace. Listen. Listen to me. Uh, where is there is a, a granny who told me I'm uh, I think that guy is maybe four or five years old. God, 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 God said to me did you know this one is praying for his class I don't know school or class and guess what prayers he's praying? He's praying the prayers you pray on Sunday morning. He listens to the things you pray. And then he prays those prayers for his classmates. And then people are asking, where does this child come from praying such things? What am I saying to you? I am saying to you, there is abundance of things to preach. The things you hear here. If you don't know what to preach, send me a WhatsApp. message of Varab. I will give you scriptures that you should focus on when you preach. I will only do it once. Because from then on, God will show you. You can do it. If you want messages, you can come. Any one of you, actually. Anyone. You want messages, you can come. I demonstrated this thing. Who won this message? The one that I'm busy hey. teaching. Who needs this hey. message? Hey, Kiri, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying you must grab it. You must, you must be quick to grab. But it's a floor. But it's a floor. <laughs> I'm demonstrating it so that you can know, you can have the messages. You can say, Muruti, you once thought about this and that. Can you please send me that? I will send it to you. you yeah, I'll print it and give it to you. Please come. When we say Bahulu Rabbats are the parents, mm, we come here to cover our children. I want to, I want to be a covering for this. I'm coming here. I'm going to become a covering for this children. Pray for them. Me, I want to see them serve the Lord. I want to see them manifesting the life of Christ to their generation in their generation just stand as a covering stand as a covering oh salabashika yes lord